Our chapel speaker this morning is Dr. Abe Curavilla. He serves as our Senior Research Professor of Preaching and Pastoral Ministries here at DTS. He has a medical degree from the University of Kerala in India, a PhD in Immunology from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, took his Dermatology residency at Boston University and of Medis uh, School of Medicine, then moved on to theological education, obtaining a THM from Dallas Seminary and a PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Captivated by the intricacies of the interpretive movement from scripture to sermon, Abe uh, centers his ministry around homiletics, exploring preaching through research and scholarship, explaining preaching by training the next generation of church leaders, and by exemplifying preaching in regular pulpit engagements. Before joining the faculty here full-time, he was an adjunct professor in pastoral ministries. He's also served as interim pastor of several churches, past president <clears throat> excuse me, of the Evangelical Homiletic Society. He's still a, a diplomat of the American Board of Dermatology and maintains an active clinical schedule alongside of working full-time here. His research areas include hermeneutics as it operates in the homiletical undertaking, and the theology and spirituality of preaching and pastoral leadership. He's single by choice, and he also has a special interest in the theology of Christ-centered singleness and celibacy. Abe, thank you for your diligence. Thank you for uh, the writing that you're doing, the influence that you're having. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Abe Curavilla to our platform this morning? He was the most brilliant man ever born in the US. At 18 months of age, he was reading the New York Times. At three, his father taught him the Greek alphabet and he promptly began reading Homer in Greek, of course. At the same time, he taught himself also how to read Latin. By age five, he had written a treatise on anatomy, and by age six, he spoke seven languages fluently. At eight, he passed MIT's entrance exam, and at nine, Harvard's, but they judged him too young to enter. They made him wait till he was 11. <laughs> he graduated from Harvard at 16, already teaching there part-time. His IQ was between 250 and 300. Now bear in mind that Einstein's IQ was only a paltry 200. William Sidus was his name. And I can tell from the utterly blank looks on your faces that you have never heard of him. A man so brilliant he could conquer any language in one day, one 24-hour day. He died in 1944, aged 46. And what was he doing at the end of his life? He was working as a minor clerk doing menial duties in a New York business office. Sidus had wasted his life pursuing trivia, refusing to accept responsibilities, turning down great opportunities, big salaries, finally to die unknown, unheard of. Great talent, magnificent opportunities, tremendous capabilities. Started well, but didn't finish strong. In Christian life, too, it is not only how you start the race that matters, but also how you finish. And that is particularly important for all of us who are called to be leaders by God. You're in seminary, you're a leader. How will you and I finish? How will we be doing as Christian leaders 20, 30, 40 years from now? This morning we're gonna look at the last judge in the book of Judges, Samson, who did not finish well. We're going to learn what we can do not to be like him and instead to finish strongly. So grab your handouts and we will get going. 
I'll start at Genesis 13, chapter 1. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. Now that's how, that's how all the judge narratives begin, evil doing and punishment. And then a deliverer is raised up by God. That's the usual pattern, but here you have a detour. There was a certain man of Zorah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. Then the angel of the Lord was seen by the woman. I'd like you to circle the verb was seen. Here is the first of four women in Samson's life, and she is linked to the verb to see. We'll catch the significance later, but let's just move on. Then the angel of the Lord was seen by the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now, therefore, be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor to eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Being a Nazarite described separation from God, usually voluntary, and usually for a limited period of time. And such a separation meant at least four things. No drinking alcohol, no eating things unclean, no contact with things, things unclean, especially corpses, and no cutting of hair. But there were several unusual things about Samson's Nazarite ship. Even his mother had to abstain from alcohol and unclean foods. And it wasn't voluntary for this Nazarite. It was lifelong from tomb to womb. Samson's was a total dedication by Yahweh to Yahweh for his work. One master, one commitment, one dedication to God and to God alone. John Kenneth Galbraith, the well-known economist, public official, and diplomat of the 20th century, wrote in his autobiography, A Life in Our Times, about Emily Gloria Wilson, his family's housekeeper. He wrote, it had been a wearying day, and I asked Emily to hold all telephone calls while I had a nap. Shortly thereafter, the phone rang. The President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, was calling from the White House. Get me Ken Galbraith. This is Lyndon Johnson. He's sleeping, Mr. President. He said not to disturb him. Well, wake him up. I want to talk to him. No, Mr. President, I work for him, not you. <laughs> Galbraith adds, when I called the president back later, he could scarcely control his pleasure. Tell that woman, President Johnson said, tell that woman I want her right now in the White House. <laughs> That's exactly how we are called by the divine master for one total commitment to him and to him alone, like Samson. Okay, the boy is born, verse 24 of chapter 13. Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson from Shimshon, which comes from Shemesh, which means son. So Samson is Sunny Boy. Fast forward now. Sunny Boy Samson is grown up. And the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. Now, no other judge in the entire book has gotten such an explicit blessing. This was unique. And what's more, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. So Samson had all the advantages right off the block. God appointed conception, God ordained dedication, God planned destiny, God given blessing, God bestowed spirit. What will he do with all these God given advantages. Let's see, chapter 14, verse 1. Then Samson went to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Okay, we have woman number two. Please circle that. And again, the verb see. More on that later. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now get her for me as a wife. He wants to marry a Philistine woman. Now, no Israelite was ever to marry a foreigner. 
But wasn't Samson not just in Israel? He was a Nazarite dedicated to God. He should have known better. But does he care? Get her for me, for she looks right in my eyes. Who cares about God and stuff? I want this Philistine woman, and I want her now because she looks right in my eyes. Samson's misplaced gaze, his misaligned pleasure, his mistaken assessment. Anyhow, Samson goes to Timnah to arrange the wedding, verse 5. Then Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came as far as the vineyard. Wait, what's Samson doing hanging around the vineyards? As a Nazarite, he was forgot, forbidden to consume any product of the grapevine. Well, I suppose he was just probably just smelling the grapes. And uh, later, <laughs> fast forward again, during his wedding, he puts on a feast for his guests. Verse 10, Samson made a feast there for the young men customarily did this. Feast in Hebrew is mishta, which comes from the verb shata, to drink. So I'm betting that this feast probably included some choice liquids for imbibing. So what's this Nazarite teetotaler doing organizing a frat party with flowing beer? There goes his first commitment to God. Let me summarize the rest of the wedding story for you, which you probably already know. On his way to arrange the wedding, Samson encounters a lion. He kills it with his bare hands, and later on his way back, he finds honeybees in the lion's carcass, 14, 8, and 9. He turned aside to look at the carcass of the lion. Behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey into his hands and went on eating as he went. Okay, so he was intimate with alcohol. Now he proceeds to eat food contaminated by a dead animal. There goes his second commitment to God. And this is the deliverer of Israel? Back to the wedding feast, Samson poses a riddle to his Philistine guests. The bet was that the loser would give the winner a set of 30 clothes. The Philistines, clueless, threaten his wife who inweagles the answer out of Samson. And so Samson loses the bet, verse 19. And here's what he did. He, Samson, went to Ashkelon, another Philistine city, and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who had answered the riddle. He's paid off the bet. But guess what? Now he's encountered 30 corpses. And this, not in a war as part of his divine commission to deliver Israel, but just on a personal whim of vendetta. There goes his third commitment, commitment alcohol, unclean food, corpses. So much for his dedication to God. This guy is frittering away his magnificent calling. He's wasting his supernatural endowment, sabotaging his heavenly destiny. Let's cut to the chase and fast forward to the final chapter of his life, Judges 16. 16 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and he saw a prostitute there and he had relations with her. He went, he saw, he had relations. Just like that. As if it was the most routine and normal thing to do. Oh, and that's woman number three, and there is our verb, saw. Three women in his life already, each associated with the verb, to see. Let's find out why that's significant. Verse four. After this, it came about that he loved a woman whose name was Delilah. Ha! Ah, that's woman number four. But there is no C in this verse. Instead, we are told that Samson loved her. So woman number one and C, woman number two and C, woman number three and C, but woman number four, it's love. Something is different here. Fourth time is a charm. <laughs> and the lady's name? Delilah. Lila means night. So Delilah is the night woman. Sunny boy and the night woman. <laughs> For some reason, I'm not getting a good feeling about this. You know the rest of the story. The Philistines offered Delilah money to find out Samson's source of strength. So this woman tries four times. Woman number four tries 
four times to get Samson to reveal his secret. Here is the first attempt by Delilah, Judges 16, 6, and 7. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they will bind me with seven fresh cords and have not, that have not been dried, I will become weak and be like a man. I want you to underline, be like a man. You'll see in a minute why this is important. Anyhow, you know, Samson was bluffing. Delilah, Delilah ties him with seven fresh cords when he's asleep, but they don't hold him when he wakes. So she tries again, attempt number two, 10 and 11. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have deceived me and told me lies. Now please, tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If they will bind me tightly with new ropes which have not been used, I will become weak and, here it is again, be like a man. But this was a bluff too. It didn't succeed either. So Delilah comes back. Attempt number three, verse 13. Then Delilah said to Samson, Up to now you have deceived me and told me lies. Tell it me how you may be bound. And he said to her, If you will weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it with a pin, then I will become weak and, here we go again, be like a man. But this was a bluff too. Weaving his hair together didn't hold him captive. Samson es escapes again. And then we have attempt number four, made by woman number four. First three tries, failure. But we know that the fourth time is a charm. Ominous. There's a sense of doom here. Fifteen. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. It came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. And he told her all that was in his heart. And he said to her, wait, what was that? Attempt number 116, 7 we had, and Samson said to her, which I have underlined for you. Attempt number 2, 16, 11 we had, and he said to her, same thing. Attempt number 3, 16, 13 we had, and he said to her, same thing. Again, all three times, but the fourth time. The charmed fourth time, attempt number four by woman number four is different, 17. And he told her all that was in his heart, and he said to her, fourth time, a dangerous charm, and he is going to reveal all. A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved... Now, now here's an, another thing that's different this fourth time. Attempt number one, 16 and 7, Samson says, if they will bind me, that's bolded for you. It's the imperfect tense in the Hebrew. 16, 11, he says it again, if they will bind me, again, imperfect tense. Attempt number three, 16, 30, is also in the imperfect tense, if you will weave. But the fourth time, the dangerously charmed attempt number four is different. 16, 17. If I am shaved, it's the perfect tense in the Hebrew. And this fourth time, for this fourth woman, Samson reveals his secret. Even the Hebrew tenses weep at Samson's infidelity and disloyalty to God. And there goes his fourth commitment. Hey, why not? I've consumed alcohol, eaten unclean things, touched corpses. Why not get a haircut too? Who cares for God? But there is one more critical difference in this fourth charmed time. 16, 17. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and now wait for it. Be like every. The fourth time, unlike the previous three times, it, will, it is not, I will be like a man. This charming fourth time for this charming fourth woman, it is, I will be like every man. Out comes the truth. I will be like every man. This is what was driving Samson all along. He didn't want to be special. He didn't want to have anything to do with Israel. He didn't want to be a Nazarite. He didn't want to be a judge. He didn't want to be a leader. He didn't want any truck with God. He wanted out. He wanted to be like every man. This was a renunciation of his calling. 
a repudiation of his dedication, a resignation from his Nazariteship. This was defection. He had thrust God out. He had slapped God in the face. And he was washing his hands of this whole God business and going AWOL. He wanted to be like every man, enjoying his women, doing what he wanted, throwing family, tribe, nation, and God to the winds. Will you and I defect from God's calling? We, God's children, are called to be leaders in a dark world, influencing it for Christ. Will we end like Samson, repudiating our call and renouncing our responsibility? Let me finish Samson's story. His hair is cut. He loses his strength. He's captured by the Philistines. And one day they bring him out, bound captive for display and for sport during a festival. And Samson, after one final plea to God for strength, brings down the building by toppling the pillars to which he was changed. Verse 30, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed were more than those whom he killed in his life. I wanted to notice what we said. Let me die with the Philistines. He who loved with the Philistines now dies with the Philistines. The only judge in the entire book of Judges to die in an encounter with the enemy. Shimshon's Shemesh, Sonny Boy's son, had set. And Israel was now in darkness. And there would be no rest for the land. All that remains in the book is gross idolatry and a horrific civil war. How will you and I finish? We started well when we came to Christ, trusting him for our salvation. We continued well. Hey, we are in seminary. But how will we finish? Will you defect like Samson? Instead, today, would you, God's leaders, simply commit to never defecting from God's call in your life? Never defect, ever. Instead, we commit to finishing strongly by God's grace as godly servant leaders, wherever God places, whatever vineyard we are put in, not to finish like Samson, broken, blinded, blacklisted. I've got a haircut appointment this Friday. <laughs> Here's what I'm planning to do. When I sit in my barber's chair, this time and every time I return, at least for a few seconds I'm going to think, haircut, yes, defection, never. Haircut, yes, defection, never. And I'd like you to do that too. Every time you go to your barber, your hairdresser, your stylist, your manicurist, your pedicurist, your tattoo artist. <laughs> Let this go through your mind. Haircut? Yes. Defection? Never. Cut your hair or your nails by all means, but don't do a Samson. Haircut? Yes. Defection? Never. Men and women, God's leaders, let's finish well. Let's commit to doing so. Haircuts, yes. Defection, never. And may God, through his Holy Spirit, 
strengthen you all, my brothers and sisters, as you go out into the world to finish well for Jesus' sake. Haircuts, yes. Defection, never. Go in peace. Amen.